Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. I would like to start by asking you a question. How many of you are actually concerned about artificial intelligence? How many of you have seen films in which you saw robots and that made you think, that is not a world I want to live in? In other words, ladies and gentlemen, who of you is actually afraid of the algorithms? There is quite a big number of you. And they understand that. Because indeed, you can do some very bad things with artificial intelligence. Nevertheless, what I want to do in the next 15 minutes, I want to explain to you that actually that fear may be a danger in itself. I want to demystify what artificial intelligence actually is and help you to actually understand that you can also use it to our benefit. It may make our lives more valuable, longer, healthier, and safer. Right? But let's first discuss what that fear for artificial intelligence actually comes from. I am fascinated by new technologies. And that's also why I love science fiction. But what we do in science fiction, we apply a technology that's available today, or that is very well, plausible today, and we use that to create a future scenario. And that helps us to think about the world in which we want to live. But unfortunately, many makers of science fiction actually highlight the negative side effects of the technologies. And it's perfectly understandable. Fear sells better than good news. Right? I'll give you an example. In the film Ex Machina from Alex Garland in 2014, we see a robot called Eva. And the robot, somehow, during the film, discovers that she is part of an experiment and that her maker will actually delete her software at the end of it, which effectively means she's going to be killed. But for some reason, during the film, she develops this human-like survival instinct. And she then overpowers her developers and escapes into the free world. But the question, ladies and gentlemen, is how plausible is this scenario really? Can we compare artificial intelligence to a human brain? And the answer to those questions is simply no. You cannot compare a brain to a computer. Moreover, the term artificial intelligence is very unhelpful. It dates from the 1950s. And in those days, the intention was to actually program our computers in such a way that it starts to behave like a human being. But that is not what artificial intelligence means today. The closest it gets to a human brain is that it is very good at making predictions. <coughs> but in the end of the day, artificial intelligence is nothing more than math and statistics. If I ask my Google Home, hey Google, what's the capital of the Netherlands? It will reply to me, Amsterdam is the capital of the Netherlands. But it's not because the computer knows that. It is because the computer can predict that somebody asking that question will expect that answer. Right? An algorithm is no magic. It has no conscious. It has no memory. And there are many things that an algorithm cannot do. All the creativity and all the innovation that we have in this room here today, you will never get out of an algorithm. If I put all of the data of every taxi company around the world in a computer, it will not come up with the Uber business model. That requires human inventions. Right. So in many ways, I think that is a reassuring, reassuring thought. Therefore, I would like to argue that you cannot fear the technology as you cannot fear math. Right? You can, however, fear those people that apply the technology, but that's something completely different, and I'll get back to that in a minute. Having said that, what we can do with artificial intelligence already today is absolutely impressive and far-reaching. Right. Systems with artificial intelligence consistently beat us humans in the amount of data that they can process and the speed and the accuracy with which they do that. Right. And we have a lot of data these days because we are digitizing the whole world around us. 
Think about what we do on the internet in terms of searches, online purchases, and swiping left and right. Think about all the data that companies store in their administration systems, building up profiles of all their clients, including you. Think about all the sensors that we have put in our phones, but also in all the appliances and in industrial machines. And thanks to technologies such as natural language processing and image processing, we can actually interact with a computer very effectively these days. So what we can do is impressive. And the conjunction of the no big number of data that we have today and the processing power of the machine actually enables very advanced data analytics. And this is the development that we currently see. Right? Descriptive analytics is what typ what typically what a business intelligence department in a company does. They help you to get insight into what happened in the past and to give you the cause of a problem that occurred in the past. It gets a lot more interesting if we have more data and we can then find patterns and trends in those data that help us to predict what might happen in the future. That's what we call predictive analytics. But the final stage is prescriptive analytics. And there, we ask a computer an algorithm, what is the easiest way to get from A to B? What is the best solution in this circumstance? And then something interesting starts to happen. If over time, we actually figure out that the outcomes or the recommendations from A systems are very good, we start to rely on them. And then we allow those recommendations to be implemented immediately, automatically. And we have then created a smart machine or an auto autonomous system. But again, also an autonomous system is very smart. It's not human. Because humans continue to decide what the objectives are and what, other co and what the constraints are. Where we are applying artificial intelligence, fantastic new things are possible. And I've put a couple of examples on this slide here. In healthcare, we're using artificial intelligence to help medical doctors decide on to make, uh, to make diagnosis um, of an illness, uh, to decide on treatment plans and things like that. If you benchmark it consistently, algorithms that are used to recognize uh, illnesses or medical scans or photos will beat the medical doctor. Right? Your smartwatch is effectively becoming a little hospital, sending out signals if something might start to get wrong, so you can get to a doctor before it's too late. Life is getting safer. Think about the autopilot in, a, in an airplane. It has reduced the number of air crashes significantly. And we expect the same to happen once we start to use self-driving cars at a large scale. Right? And also, artificial intelligence is helping us to feed the world. We can now produce more food with fewer raw ingredients, less water, and fewer pesticides. In fact, if you look at the sustainable development goals of the United Nations, they can only be achieved if we apply artificial intelligence. So, in every sector, we see new ways of working and new business models being introduced. So, companies are looking for new solutions. Politicians are looking for new answers for the society, and also we personally have some choices to make. The impact is so big that it's justified to speak of a technological, economical, and societal transformation. And it's all just around the corner. As you may have figured out by now, I'm, I'm an optimist, and I'm very positive about all those developments, but we shall not be naive. You can indeed apply artificial intelligence in a bad way. And therefore, I think it is only justified also that we have a lot of attention for all the risks, all the ethical consequences for cybercrime, for privacy issues, and all of, all of those things. To give you an example, in American courts, a system was used called Camp Compass. And it was used to determine the, the length of a prison sentence. And it turned out 
that the algorithm was actually discriminating against black people. And what was the reason? Was it the, was it the mistake of the algorithm? Well, maybe. The real cause was that the, the algorithm was trained with decisions made by humans in the past. And because the humans discriminated, the, the discrimination was part of the database, and therefore the algorithm continued to discrimination. That is clearly a circumstance in which we have to intervene and have to make a correction. Right? Also, an example that I'm not a fan of is the Chinese system of social credits that is currently being deployed. Can you imagine that you are not allowed to travel because your social credit score is too low? That is the reality for millions of Chinese. And the interesting thing is that the databases that the Chinese use to calculate your social credit score, we also have available here in the Netherlands. We know your criminal record. We know whether you're paying your taxes on time. Right? But we don't use those databases to calculate a social credit score, because that does not fit our traditions and our culture, luckily. Right? But what we do need is an ethical framework. And therefore, it's good that NGOs, such as uh, um, AI for Good Foundation and the Future of Life Institute, they are, set, they, they are defining manifestos. Also, universities and companies are now doing that, and they have some common themes. It sounds so obvious, right? But we need these systems to be transparent. We need to be able to reverse decisions that come out of it. And clearly, a machine should be there for humans and not the other way around. Right? And in Europe, we are actually quite far ahead in regulating artificial intelligence. And I am pleased with strict laws on privacy, such as the GDPR. Uh, I think those laws are good. But the question is, why actually we in Europe are running so far behind when it comes to developing and deploying the technologies. Right. All the numbers indicate that China is, short, well, is very quickly becoming the, the world's market leader in terms of artificial intelligence, closely followed by the United States. And Europe is lagging very, very far behind. Right. And I would really like us to not only be regulating what other people are doing with the technology, but actually let us do our own research, development, and deployment of those technologies. Right? Let me conclude. Every technological, ex every industrial revolution that we have seen in the past has brought us new prosperity and new happiness. And artificial intelligence has the potential to do that once again. We are moving up in Maslow's pyramid. But the transformation that's required also needs leadership and vision. And I'd like to call upon all of you to actually get involved. Get involved in an ethical debate. Form your own image of the future. Think about what that implies for your own job, for the organization that you're responsible for, for your own life. Start to think about it, imagine it, and take decisions. Because it's, only, it's up to us, and really only up to us, to make sure that the dystopian stories from the science fiction don't become reality. So let's embrace the new opportunities and not fear it. Thank you very much.